So I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Amy Meltzer. She's an active member of Grow Native Massachusetts and the Massachusetts Pollinator Network. And she's on the research team for Elder Climate Action, has been gardening with native plants for more than 10 years. Um, incidentally, Massachusetts Pollinator Network is a project of uh, Northeast Organic Farmers Farming Association and is dedicated to promoting and protecting pollinators statewide. Their uh, website is masspollinatornetwork.com, an excellent resource. And that's where this program will be, uh, a recording of this program will be archived. So this program will be recorded. Uh, please put any questions that you might have in the Q&A for Amy to respond to at the end of the program. Amy, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, John. I wanna thank John and also Rosemary Malfi, um, the coordinator of Mass Pollinator Network for organizing this. And this is being hosted and recorded by Focus Springfield, a community TV station. And I also wanna thank all of you for coming and for patiently waiting for us to start. We're sorry it took so long. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about how native plants are the foundation of a healthy functioning ecosystem. Um, I wanna encourage people, this will be archived and you'll be able to get access to it, but feel free to take pictures of slides. And I'm also gonna give you access to a packet of resource slides at the end. So I'm gonna, I have several topics I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna talk about the biodiversity crisis because I think uh, we're a lot less informed about that than about the climate crisis. Um, and it's an important foundation for actually why I'm giving this talk, why native plants are important. I'm gonna talk about the interdependence of native plants and trees with insects and birds and how they actually depend on each other for survival. Um, and I have a section on how to garden to support biodiversity. And then I have resource slides that I won't go through in detail, but I'll tell you how to get access to them. So the biodiversity crisis, um, all the most recent UN reports from the scientists who've been studying climate and also have the scientists who've been studying biodiversity um, have been reporting that climate change and biodiversity loss are equally threatening to human existence. There are over a million animal and plant species now facing extinction, many in a short period of time. And if these crises are not dealt with together, they will both get worse. So I'm sure most of you know, there's a big um, international climate conference going on right now in Egypt. And yesterday was Biodiversity Day. Um, and the same message is coming out that these crises are equally important and we really have to be addressing both of them. So this is some data about why this is a crisis. Um, in North America, we've lost almost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's almost 30% of the bird population. And a major reason why we're losing birds is because many of the, them depend on insects as a fundamental food source and we're losing insects. There are 41% of insect species around the world that are in decline, and they're falling at a rate of about 2.5% per year. And if this rate continues, they could be gone by the end of the century. There's 400 native bee species in Massachusetts, which does not include honeybees, um, and many of them are in decline. But it's not too late to... that's currently at risk. But if we plant the plants that that bee depends on for survival, we can start, we can save that bee. So uh, this presentation is about what we can do to help restore the species that are at risk. So E.O. Wilson, who's a renowned American naturalist who actually died this past year said, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. So what makes insects so important? They're really fundamental to the functioning of all ecosystems. They pollinate many of the important food crops around the, year, the world. Um, they pollinate 90% of flowering plants, which means plants depend on them for reproduction and can't survive without pollinating them. 
insects are food for many species. And then beyond that, there's many other species that eat the creatures that eat insects. So they're kind of the uh, important basis of the food web. Um, there are many insects in soil that help with decomposition. And in that process, they're aiding to sequester carbon in soil. So they're actually helping to slow climate change. And without insects, that process would get worse. So there are a number of causes of insect decline. And the major cause is a, a loss of habitat. Um, and then under that heading, this big field of industrial agriculture. It's a monocrop. Most industrial fields, um, there's a lot of pesticide use, which kills insects. There's herbicide use, which kills plants that insects depend on. Um, you can see in the lower left, deforestation, major loss of habitat for many species, including insects. Um, urbanization, you can see if you're in an area where there's very few plants or no plants. There's nothing for insects to live on. And then a less known cause of the decline of insects and the loss of habitat is our widespread use of non-native plants. Most plants that we get in nurseries are from other regions. And I'm going to explain pretty soon how they don't support native insects the way native plants do. So pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers all either kill insects kill the plants they depend on or damage the health of soil. Invasive plants and insects also take over habitat um, away from native insects and plants. Um, light pollution at night, there's um, a lot of research now emerging that shows that that disrupts reproductive cycles um, and some insects just wear themselves out flying it. If you were, any of you remember years ago, there used to be lots of moths flying around light bulbs at night. And we hardly see them anymore. And then, of course, climate change is also a factor. It actually has a bigger impact in the tropics than here. But of course, if there's huge flooding or fires, habitat is being lost. Hmm. There we go. So. OK, so in this section, I'm going to talk about how insects and plants and other species have evolved to have um, mutually beneficial relationships with each other and depend on each other for their survival. So I'm going to give some definitions first. Um, native plants are plants that evolved with other species in a given region in the North, in North America. That's understood to be plants that were here before European colonization. But the ecoregion matters too. California, very different ecosystem. Species evolved there together that didn't evolve here. So that plants from California are not native to New England, just as one example. Non-native plants are plants um, that have been brought here from either other ecoregions or other continents. And they do not offer the same ecosystem support that native plants do even plants that were brought here hundreds of years ago. And I'll give some examples and explain more about that. <clears throat> Invasive plants are non-native plants that grow very aggressively and they crowd out native plants. You can see one here on the right that's actually smothering plants. Probably some of you have seen bittersweet growing thick vines and taking trees down. So they disrupt ecosystems both above and below ground. Some invasive plants actually exude chemicals from their roots that um, poison nearby plants so that they can spread out and take over more territory. So insects and native plants have been co-evolving for 125 million years and developing mutually beneficial characteristics. So as I said earlier, plants depend on insects to pollinate them so they can reproduce. And so they need to attract insects. And insects depend on plants for food, both adult insects and then um, the next generation of insects use food from plants in different forms that I'll describe a little later. So for plants to avoid being eaten excessively by insects, they've developed defenses. One of the main ones is that they um, 
create toxic chemicals that make them either poisonous or unpalatable to most insects. Um, and in response, insects have evolved enzymes that allow them to bypass this toxicity, but they've only done this for specific plants. So the result of this is um, the evolution of very specialized insect plant relationships. So 90% of insects can only get food from very specific plants or can only get food for the next generation from specific plants and can't survive without those plants. And most plants can only be pollinated by certain insects. And I'm gonna show you examples of this. So they've evolved symbiotic traits that so they kind of match each other and they can get food and they can get pollinated. But again, these are specialized relationships. There's some insects that are generalists and can get food from a number of plants, but they're very much in the minority. So this has happened over many, many, many thousands, actually millions of years. Um, people have said to me, well, you know, why can't a plant that's been here 400 years support insects that are local? And if you think about it, it would be really convenient if humans could eat wood. You know, imagine if you're lost in the woods for a few days and you run out of food. You know, if you could get nutrition out of trees, that would be really useful. But you can imagine how long it would take us to evolve to be able to digest trees. And that's Imagine that with insects and plants. That's how specialized the relationships are. So most non-native and even most hybridized plants don't provide benefit to native insects. And I'll give more information about that too. So here's some examples of specialized relationships. Um, on the left is a hummingbird moth and you can see it has a very long curly tongue and only an insect or actually a hummingbird with can get nectar and can pollinate a plant that has a long tubular flower like these Monarda plants. So hummingbirds are actually the only bird in North America that can pollinate. And there are bees and moths that have evolved to have long tongues and they match the flowers that have long tubular shapes. And then there are some plants that have really thick closed petals and only bumblebees can get into those plants. So closed up tight and that's the only bee that's strong enough to get in there. So here's a relationship that probably most of you have heard about which is monarch butterflies and milkweed. So on the left is a monarch, um, a milkweed plant with a monarch egg on it. And on the right, you can see a monarch caterpillar. There's also a little monarch butterfly up there in the corner. And the butterfly can get nectar from a number of different flowers. But the, when the caterpillar hatches, the only plant it can eat is milkweed. So if you have a garden with lots of flowers and lots of butterflies, unless you have milkweed plants, you don't have anything for supporting the next generation. So. Here's the story about hybridized plants. I'm gonna use Echinacea as an example. So on the upper right, you can see, this is the original species of Echinacea with lots of different butterflies on it. I'm sorry, on the left. And on the right, there's a goldfinch eating the seeds of an Echinacea plant. So this is an example of what native plant species can provide. They give nectar for adult insects, they provide pollen and leaves to feed the offspring. And I'll, I have a slide to show explain that relationship to you. They provide seed for birds. And because they're growing from seed, they have genetic variability. And that means that each generation of plant is going to have some little differences in it, which means it might be more resilient to something like a year where there's a drought or a year where there's flooding that there might be a few plants that uh, have characteristics that enable them to live through an adverse event like that and then go on and reproduce. So in contrast, the plants below are echinacea plants that have been hybridized just basically to be decorative. It's, you know, if someone likes how that put it in their garden, but these plants have no pollen, they don't have any nectar, they don't produce seeds, 
and they're clones. Every plant like this is basically from the same original plant. So there's no genetic variation. So that means, you know, these plants, aside from not supporting other species, if some event comes along that they can't handle, they're all going to be wiped out because there's no variation. So there are a lot of hybridized plants that are advertised as being good for pollinators that really aren't. So it's um, if you want to be planting to support native species um, of insects, it's safest to go with the original species of the plant, which means it doesn't have another name after it in quotes. Um, there are some hybridized plants that do retain ecological value, but there aren't very many of them. So, you know, again, if you love it and you want to plant it, that's fine. But if you're planting for ecosystem support, it's good to know that you're putting in plants that actually will support insects and birds. Doug Tallamy created this chart. He's a really leading groundbreaking researcher <clears throat> on the relationships between native plants <clears throat> and insects. And this chart demonstrates how non-native plants don't evolve to be helpful to native species. So on the left is a list of plants from other continents. To the column to the right of them um, shows you how many different species these plants support in their home territory. So that ranges from 40 to 400 species. And then the next column shows you how many species they support in North America, and that ranges from zero to eight. And then you see on the right how many years these plants have been here, and that ranges from 100 to 300 years. So again, that's a demonstration of how they don't evolve to be, to be able to support native species. So here's a comparison with trees. Um, ginkgo trees, which, you know, are planted all over the place, I think, because they're pretty and they're hardy. Um, they're native to China. They support one species in the U.S., and they've been here 240 years. So on average, non-native plants support zero to five insect species. In comparison, oak trees, which are one of the most beneficial plants you can put in, they support over 500 species and hundreds of those are insects. So on average, native plants support 13 times more insect species than non-native plants. And what's important is to understand that we're not just trying to provide food for adult insects, that the whole life cycle needs to be supported. And the way this works is moths and butterflies lay their eggs on leaves. When the eggs hatch, the caterpillars eat the leaves. And I'm gonna show you soon, there's research showing that thousands of caterpillars are needed as food for just one nest of birds. And most caterpillars can only eat leaves from very specific plant species. And those, plants that can support the next generation are called host plants. And here's an example <clears throat> on the right. This is a spice bush butterfly. That's a very cute spice bush caterpillar on a spice bush plant because that's the only leaf that caterpillar can eat. So something similar happens with bees. They collect pollen from plants to store in their nests. And I want to say, you know, we're really familiar with honeybees and we know about hives. Um, most native bees are solitary bees. Most of them also don't sting. They make tunnels in the ground, they make tunnels in wood, and they um, put pollen balls, oops, didn't mean to do that, in the tunnels. Um, and then when their eggs hatch, the larvae eat the pollen. And again, they can only eat the pollen from very specific plants. So those are host plants for bees. So to feed the next generation of pollinators, you need to have host plants. And we need, host plants are really important because birds eat lots of caterpillars. So we're not only planting so that the insects can reproduce and keep going, we're planting because other species need to eat these insects. So Desiree Narango was a student of Doug Tallamy's. She's now, you know, an independent researcher. She did really wonderful research showing the chickadees need six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise just one nest. 
And if there weren't enough native plants in the area, the nestlings didn't survive. So caterpillars mostly eat the leaves of woody plants. That's not universally true, but that's where the vast majority of them get their food. <clears throat> so in order to for these birds to thrive, um, the area needed to have 94 to 100% woody native plants. If there was under 70% woody native plants, the nestlings didn't have enough food and some of them didn't survive. So the rule of thumb people are using now is that to have a viable ecosystem where species thrive and reproduce themselves, um, you need at least 70% native plant biomass. So it's not counting how many plants you have, you're estimating the volume of native plant foliage. Um, I used to think, you know, so actually, if you think about it, one oak tree is going to have a lot more biomass than a clump of, you know, Monarda plants. So that's what you want to estimate is the biomass. And what this means is you're going to have holes in your leaves. And I had to get used to this idea because, you know, I think most of us are brought up to want to have these pristine gardens. Um, but the holes, as you can see in these um, birch leaves on the left, means that the plant, that that tree is feeding caterpillars, which are either going to grow up to be moths and butterflies, or they're being eaten by birds. So it's actually great to have holes in your leaves, and it's not hurting the plant. That's the birch tree. You know, if the holes bother you, just kind of step back, look at it from a distance. But I actually get really happy when I see the holes now, because my plants are doing their job as part of a uh, interdependent ecosystem. So some plants support more insect species than others. Really pretty striking about 5% of native plant species feed 75% of insect species. And there's two types of keystone plants, the ones that feed the caterpillars of the vast majority of butterflies and moths and the plants that provide pollen for the specialist bees to feed to their offspring. So the keystone plants are really important. Um, and if you're starting out or adding plants to your garden, native plants, um, you can look for keystone plants, but you don't have to limit yourself to that because the more diversity of plants you have, the more species you're gonna be supporting. Blue carner butterfly can only live on uh, the blue lupine flower. So that plant, the lupine's only supporting one butterfly, but without it, we would lose that butterfly. So diversity is good. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. This, is, this slide is in the resource packet that I'll give you um, access to, but these are some examples of some of the main keystone plants in the Northeast. On the left, there's a list of trees. On the right, there's a list of herbaceous flowering plants and shrubs. And then you'll also have access to this really complete list of keystone plants, um, which is on the Grow Native Massachusetts website. And here's an example. Bumblebees are the only bee that pollinate blueberries. So if we lose bumblebees, I would be very unhappy. I love blueberries. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on underground, just because this is another aspect of how ecosystem species depend on each other. And I think this is really fascinating. So I'm sure you recognize the mushrooms. Those are actually the fruiting body of this vast underground network of filaments called mycorrhizal fungi. So the mushrooms pop up when the, the mycorrhiza are reproducing, but these, filaments are underground all the time, and they form relationships with 95% of plant species all around the world. And they really provide very important functions. This is fairly new research. Um, so there's just a lot of new information coming out all the time. So the mycorrhiza connect to the roots of plants. They transfer nutrients and water and carbon into soil and between plants. They help protect plants from disease. Um, they themselves get nutrients from plants because they don't photosynthesize and plants do. So there's this, you know, again, mutual exchange, mutual dependency that's going on. And they really help 
keep ecosystems healthy with what they're providing underground. They're also really important for storing carbon in plants and soil. So again, they're an, a really important part of dealing with climate change. So in their slot that they can increase resilience to climate change because they reproduce so quickly. You know, trees live a really long time, but you know, if you walk in the woods after a rain, there's mushrooms popping up and that's the new generation of mushrooms. So they can evolve quickly. And since they're um, kind of programmed to support their partner plants because of these interdependent relationships, they can adapt more quickly to conditions that are changing and help the surrounding plants and trees adapt too. So again, they've um, developed these mutually beneficial relationships with native plants that help keep ecosystems healthy. So that means that having healthy soil is really important both for supporting biodiversity and increasing carbon storage. I mean, obviously, if you're planting something, you have to <laughs> dig a hole in the ground, but you don't do more digging than you have to because you want to leave those fungal filaments intact as much as possible. Um, you want to avoid using chemicals because they're going to damage soil organisms. So even things like you know, chemicals that say they're not going to hurt your plant. So, you know, like a de-icer, I don't trust that it's not going to hurt what's in the soil. Um, so I think you really want to be really careful to minimize any chemical use. And there's also research showing that the more diverse the plantings are, <clears throat> the more um, carbon gets stored in the soil and the healthier the plants in the soil are. And then another aspect of this, I'll talk about this more too for protecting insects, but if you leave leaves on the ground, they not only provide shelter for insects, but they provide nutrients for the soil. It's the best fertilizer. And then again, removing invasive plants is important because they're going to disrupt soil health and plant health. So in this section, I'm going to talk about how to garden to support biodiversity. in such drastic decline is because they've lost habitat. Um, and there's actually not enough wild habitat left to support all these species that are at risk. In the US, there's 40 million acres that are lawns, which is equal to the acreage of the continental national parks. In Massachusetts, 20% of the land is in lawn, and basically they're ecosystem deserts. You can see it's a monoculture, there's no flowers, there's no diversity, um, and many people use chemicals on their lawns. So they're just, most lawns don't support life. Um, and they actually, right, you can see this is just a little sidewalk strip right next to a street, but it's bursting with all these different plants, which the roots are gonna filter the water and help prevent flooding. They're providing pollen and nectar for insects. Um, so that's just a much healthier way to plant than to have a turf monoculture. And here's another little example of that. The turf grass is up here on the far left, and it's a tiny little plant with tiny little roots. So compared to these native plants that have flowers, they have seeds, they have long roots that are storing carbon, uh, they're uh, helping to filter water, just these native plants are much healthier to have for an ecosystem than turf grass, which is basically keeping the soil from blowing away. Those roots are so short, they barely even store any carbon. So back to Doug Tellamy, he has started an organization and a website called Homegrown National Park because he really believes if most of us turned half of our lawns into 70% native habitat, we could save all these species that are at risk. And this is an example of a homeowner in um, suburban Boston. She used to have nothing but grass in front of her house. And in the last couple of years, she's put in native trees and shrubs and grasses and flowering plants. So she's creating this wonderful habitat. So obviously not everyone can do that. You might not have the space, you might not have the money, um, but 
So you can start small, you know, just if you have a garden, put in native plants when you're choosing to put in plants. And you can just start the process of turning your lawn into life supporting habitat. I mean, some people just decide, you know, what do I really need my lawn for? You know, where do I want to walk? Where do I want to have recreation? And then give the rest, if you're able to, over to native plants and stop using chemicals on it. I'm going to uh, talk a little more than our traditional way of taking care of them. So if you're getting started planting native plants, um, you want to start out the same way you would with any garden. You need to see where do you have light, where do you have shade, how moist is your soil, and then you decide what kind of habitat do you want? Are you gonna add some native plants to a bed that you already have? Do you have space to start a new bed? Do you wanna make use of a lawn? You can add trees and create a little woodland. You can create a meadow. And then again, I can talk about how to diversify the lawn that you have. And it's really beneficial to plant in layers the way you see nature doing it. You know, If you're in the woods, there's trees, there's shrubs, there's ground covers. Just the more uh, layers of plants you have, the more diversity you have, the more life you're supporting. And then, of course, you always need to keep an eye out for invasives and keep removing them. So the goals for a native garden are, this is to provide the most benefit to other local species. If you have a variety of native flowers that are in bloom from spring through fall, They'll support a wide variety of insects. They actually emerge at different times. They need pollen and nectar at different times. They're nest building at different times. So the longer the bloom season, the better. If you can plant in groups of three to five, it makes it easier for the insects to forage. Just they can stay in one area instead of going from plant to plant long distances. Um, again, here's the, um, the link to getting the list of keystone plants, the ones that support the most species. And then again, aiming to grow 70% native biomass, the volume of plant material that you have. And then um, Rob Gajir is a really wonderful bee researcher out of UMass Amherst. And he has been create, doing lots of research and he's created a list of plants that he keeps adding to that support the insects that are most at risk and in decline in Massachusetts. So this is a spreadsheet that has the plants, it has what kind of grow, you know, how much light they need, how much water they need, how tall they get. Um, so that's a good resource also. It's another good place to start for figuring out which plants to add because these plants will support the insects that need the most help. So maintaining an ecological garden, changing our habits. Um, I think, you know, our tradition is to make everything really tidy and cleaned up. And that actually is not good for the life cycle of insects. There are insects that overwinter in plant stems. There are insects that overwinter in leaves in the ground. So if you leave plant stems standing all winter, if you leave leaves on the ground, I wouldn't do it on the lawn because if, you know, they might rot the lawn if they are wet and matted for a long time. But really, most other places can handle um, leaf cover. And then clean up in the spring. So one thing I found is I think gardens are beautiful with the plants standing all winter. They have, it's kind of sculptural. They're different shapes. Um, of flowers, different colors of, you know, it's in the brown range, but they're beautiful. They look beautiful with snow on them. You're also leaving um, seeds for birds to forage during the winter. So leave things up all winter. And then in the spring, you clean up leaves only where you need to. If they're really thick and you're worried that they're too matted and wet, you can clean them away from your plants. And if you have room and pile, um, for one thing, you can get leaf mold, which is wonderful fertilizer, but you're also leaving a place for insects to keep emerging. If you cut the plant stems down to about 15 inches after it starts to warm up in the spring, you can stack those to the side. And again, you'll get insects come. I don't notice it happening, but if the insects are still in there, they have a chance to survive. 
And then all the things that you see in nature that nature just leaves lying around are actually really helpful. Rocks, dead trees, tree limbs, you know, if you have places to leave things like that, those all provide shelter and nutrition for insects. If you have neighbors that are gonna be upset, you can make the edges tidy. You can put up a pollinator habitat sign just to tell them what you're doing. You're doing it on purpose. You're not just being a lazy gardener. Um, and then here's a link to the Wild Seed Project, which has more detail about why it's important to leave the leaves and how to manage that. So other maintenance issues, um, insects and birds need water, especially during our hot summers. It can just be a saucer. Um, it's good to have pebbles in it because insects, I find this kind of amusing, but they need to stand on something while they drink. Um, and as I mentioned, nightlight is really disruptive for insects and birds. So what you can do about that is either leave your lights off, put them on motion sensors, but also any bulbs that you're using I don't mean to get like the bright yellow insect bulbs, but all bulbs come in a spectrum of color and there's kind of cold blue at one end and kind of warmer yellowish at the other end. The yellower ones are much easier for insects, but also for human mental health. There's again emerging uh, research about this. So how you can have a lawn that is actually beneficial. So what you can do is um, mow just every two to three weeks. Allow your grass, There's, you can see if you let it grow, you're gonna get little flowers in it. You can leave the grass clippings because they're good for the poison the insects that we're trying to attract. And butterflies will come pollinate them and get nectar from them. And then as soon as you have insects in the lawn, birds follow. So this is, I mean, what I haven't talked about yet is how much fun this is. <laughs> I used to garden just for visual beauty, you know, color and texture and bloom time, which was fun. But now having all this life come to mind, you just see all this variety, you see the interactions, you see insects, you see birds. Um, it's, it's really exciting. So I'm not gonna go through this list. This will be in the resource packet. This is from the Wild Seed Project. These are plants you can add to your lawn, plants you can allow to just pop into your lawn and which ones you should take out because um, they'll become a problem. So a little more on why you should avoid using chemicals. Um, pesticides, you might be trying to target a particular insect. They'll kill any insect they come in contact with. Herbicides will kill the plants that insects depend on. And these chemicals tend to seep into waterways. They can damage aquatic life. They also disrupt the healthy relationships among the organisms that live in the soil. And many last for years in soil and in plants. So for instance, if you're buying plants from a nursery that used pesticides, the pesticide is going to be in the pollen, it's going to be in the nectar, it could poison that insect. If the insect is taking some plant, though, it's really good to avoid them. If you have a terrible invasive plant infestation, um, there are people, including Doug Tallamy, who very carefully uses herbicide, but I would get advice from an ecologist about it, not a company that's making their living selling poison, basically. So get someone to help you who cares about not damaging the other life in your area. So we're dealing with climate change. I'm going to give some examples about this. Um, we've all been seeing droughts and heat and flooding rains. And um, in my yard in Cambridge, I have a shady front area, but it's right next to a really hot street. So when we're having heat waves, that's what happens to my ginger and my uvula area. It just, they are really unhappy there. Um, in my backyard, even though it's not very far away, it's cool, a little bit cooler. And so there's the American ginger, um, not the European ginger on the left. And it's just much happier in that area. So again, this is similar to just regular gardening where you wanna put in um, the plant that's gonna has 
that likes the growing conditions for the spot you have. But since conditions are changing, we really need to watch um, and realize that there's some things that need to be moved. Some things may not be happy in your yard anymore. And we can do research to find out which plants will do well under these conditions. So this is where I like to do research. Um, the Native Plant Trust website has a plant finder tool, which you can put in. Like this summer, I was putting in, I wanted the straight species, I wanted shade, I wanted drought resistant plants that like dry soil. So you can put in the characteristics that you're looking for and it'll give you a list. And then I like to go to Prairie Moon Nursery because they have beautiful pictures and more information. Um, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center also has good descriptions, but they're in Texas. So their bloom time, I find, is not at Garden. Also just another place to get great information and kind of inspiration about plants. And then again, you can go to that spreadsheet of plants for which ones support endangered insects. And if you can, plant some of those because you'll be helping the insects that most need it. So um, when again, when you go out to look for plants, um, what you want to be looking for are the straight species of native plants, because I explained how the hybrids are cultivar. Again, if you love another plant, you want to plant it. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just talking about what to do if your goal is to be planting to support other species. You should use the native plant species, pesticide-free plants. If you can get plants grown from seed, that's wonderful. Wing and a Prayer Nursery in Cummington does that. Native Plant Trust does that. And there are other places that do. And just, there's a lot of marketing now, plants for pollinators, because you know these companies know people care about pollinators now. But if they're not telling you that it's plants that are specific to our region, and they're the straight species, then you really need to look into what's actually, what they're selling, because it might just be that it's not gonna have the ecosystem function that you want it to have. Can use some education, unless they're already, you know, really focused on growing and planting native plants, they need to know that people care about that, that people are looking for that, and then they'll be, they'll provide that. So I prefer to shop at native plant nurseries, but there are other nurseries that carry native plants. And there's a spreadsheet here, again, this will be in the resource list um, of nurseries that carry native plants. The first page has nurseries that just have them. The second page has plant uh, nurseries that are all native. So I'm not going to go through this summary because it's things I've taught. This will be in your resources list. I realize we started late. I want to have time for questions. And then bigger story than what we do in our gardens. We can really make a big difference in our gardens. If the more people who are planting native plants, the more good we're going to be doing, but we also need to be protecting and restoring really all natural habitat. This came out in the UN conference this week too. They they store carbon and they support the most species. So um, that goes beyond gardening, but that's something to keep in mind, it's something to advocate for. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these things that I've talked about, but one thing that I think gardeners really need to know is that peat bogs store enormous amounts of carbon and when they're disturbed that carbon gets released and I used to use a lot of peat moss in my garden and I know a lot of people still do and it's being sold everywhere and we really need to phase that out for um, for climate reasons. Um, one substitute that people are starting to experiment with is coir. It's coconut fiber. It really has the same um, functions that peat moss has as a mulch. Um, so that's something to try out. And then, of course, there's always fallen leaves. So these are my resource slides that I'm not going to go through. I'll tell you how you can access them. So there's plant lists, sources of plants. These are great resources. If There are a lot of pollinator groups around the state, but if you go to the Mass Pollinator Network website, you can get access to those. Um, Massachusetts. Oh, I'm I'm not going to go through all those um, descriptions of what they provide. 
And then these are also terrific books. So I want to end with a quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's a professor of environmental biology and a Native American who really grew up in a tradition of being connected to nature. And she said, in some Native languages, the term for plants translates to those who take care of us. And now we need to take care of them. So I'm putting my title page up again because there are two ways for you to get the resource slides. One is this um, presentation is being recorded and it's going to be posted on the Massachusetts Pollinator website. But if you would just like a PDF packet of the resource slides, you can send me an email. So you might want to take a picture of that or I want to stop sharing so I can see people. Um, if you don't get to that in time, just go through whoever sent you the uh, message about the presentation and you'll be able to get this information. So thank you everybody for being here. I'm sorry it's late, um, but if anyone wants to stay and ask questions, John will help out with that. I'm, John? Uh, I'm, I'm here, but I, I don't know how to access the questions uh, if anyone has uh, put them in. Uh, is Brendan uh, from Focus Springfield able to help us with that? I am Actually, here, and um, anyone should be able to use the chat to submit a question. Oh, the chat okay. is the chat is enabled. Yes. It looks okay. Like so, um, let's see. Has anyone entered anything in the chat? I don't. I don't see any chats at this time. <laughs> I guess people can also raise your hand if oh, you just I, want I to I am talk. seeing a comment from Jeannie Devine saying peat is often cited as a way to increase acid. What are good alternatives? Uh, the, uh, the only alternative I'm aware of is um, sulfur, elemental sulfur. And I don't know how to answer that, Jean, but that's something we could do some research on. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's see. So someone wanted the link to the Keystone plants. Um, why don't I put my email in here? And... not seeing how to do the oh here we go i'm going to put in my email and then if anyone has questions or want in information just send me an email message okay what are your what's your opinion about plants like russian sage that are not native but are beneficial. So um, insects go to them for pollen or nectar. I'm not sure who sent that message. So I think it's fine to have some of those, um, but just keep in mind, they're probably not supporting the life cycle of insects. So you just wanna make sure, you know, like if you stick to the keystone plants, add some of those, um, add some host plants and, add as many native plants as you can. It's not bad to have non-native plants, but you just want to have enough native plants that the species that are at risk have enough support to keep reproducing and eating and feeding the next generation. So it's not like you have to pull out all your native plants, but just put in as many natives as you can. Um, oh, so here's a question about I think it's a definition of what's the range of native plants. So that comes up a lot and people have different opinions about it. Um, you know, some people say anything east of the Mississippi. Um, some people say anything in New England, anything in your county. Um, what Doug Tallamy says is what's important is that the plants have um, functional relationships with the local insects. So, um, I think people just 
John and Jean might, and I see um, Brucey's here. There's a lot of knowledgeable people here. Other people might want to chime in on this. I think people define the boundaries in different ways. I know I try to get things that are native to New England, but I think echinacea is probably a prairie plant. Um, so some people might not want to plant it. I do. Um, so it's people have different definitions. Does anyone want to add to that? Mm -hmm. I guess not. I'm uh, planning other talks that we can tell people about. Um, you mean the same talk, Brucey? Oh, you're, oh. She's muted, so. Oh, dear. Oh, there, now I can unmute okay. myself. Okay. Yes, I was wondering if you have either this talk or, or other topics uh, planned for uh, any time in the next few months that we can share uh, to encourage still more people to hear you. Um, this is the main talk I give. Sometimes I change the focus a little bit depending on the group I'm speaking with, but uh, this is going to be posted on the Pollinator website, and I'm happy to give talks if there are other groups that want to hear me. I just would like to spread the word. So I do have some others planned, but they're kind of for like at a high school and situated. And... But I'll let you know if there's more coming up. And I'll speak also to the matter of the echinacea. Um, it provides, the stray species at least, provides a lot of seed that the birds eat this time of year. And you mentioned earlier the joy of, of native plant gardening and getting up early and looking out your window and seeing all the birds that are in the garden at this time of year foraging is just such a great experience. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see, do I have any materials that people can use to convince neighbors to stop using pesticides? <laughs> I wish I did. Does anyone, can anyone recommend something? That would be great. You mean like a flyer or a handout? I don't have that, but that sounds very useful. Perhaps Massachusetts Pollinator Network would have some uh, material about that. Mm, that's right, because they're also connected to the Northeast yeah. Farmers Association. They do a lot of work on pesticides. Amy, would you like to respond to the question about uh, from Jacob? Aside from leaf mulch, what other kind of mulches do you recommend for weed suppression? I think I'm starting to experiment with coconut coir. Um, I just bought it and I haven't used it yet. <laughs> um, but Meredith Galog Galogli, who's at um, Grenada, Massachusetts, was recommending it. So I think this is something new for us to learn about is what to replace peat moss with. Um, so stay tuned. It, we'll it, it might also be, uh, it makes sense, you know, sustainable landscaping is all about using available resources and, um, or, uh, uh, you know, what you can access fairly locally. Uh, sometimes wood chips or, or chipped uh, chip branch wood is another uh, ver a ver variety of that, that uh, sometimes you can get uh, resource, you know, some of these resources are locally available. Uh, leaves can be a mulch, of course. Uh, they don't yeah. last as long as wood chips, but uh, but they're certainly effective while they while they're there. And then also, what about salt marsh hay? Sure, why not? And then you know, the other thing to keep in mind is eventually you want to have a really densely planted garden. You know, when it's when you've put in new plants, they're small and there's space around them but you really want them to grow together. That's how nature works. You know, these gardens where there's a lot of mulch around every plant is really for the benefit of landscapers. It makes life easier for them, but that's not really the healthiest way for plants to grow. So let them get big so you don't even need mulch. Let's see. A beautiful plant, shale barrens buckwheat, native to the shale barrens of West Virginia attractive to a vast array of wasps and bees. Uh, it might not be native to your Connecticut garden. I mean, you can, if you go to Go Botany, which is part of the Native Plant Trust website, it'll tell you the native range of the plant. But again, if it's supporting lots of bees and wasps and you love it, then you should keep it and just add other plants that you know are native to the area. I'd oh, like to point out uh, Freddie Gillespie's comment about salt marsh hay not uh, not being available, and it's a finite resource declining with rising oceans. Ah, okay, then not a good idea. 
Oh, so Jean has a good suggestion about um, placing signs that say this is a pollinator attracting pesticide free zone. That's great modeling for other people. And here's someone who's had good experience with core. So did I miss anything? Let's see, do birds eat the small dust like seeds? That's an interesting question. If they're dust like, is that a wind pollinated plant? So I'm not sure the answer to that. I don't know if anyone else knows. Uh, no, just really small seeds like blue lobelia, cardinal flower. Oh. Um, just really small. I, I, and it comes up a lot. How much can I, can I take off or deadhead? And oh. if they're tiny dust like, I can't imagine needing to leave them for the birds. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, I'm guessing. I don't know the answer, but I see lots of birds pecking around in the soil. And I I think that would be a good thing to get more information about. Do you know for sure, John, or are you guessing too? Well, I, I think it's it's true that dust like seeds would, would not be uh, found or, or useful to birds. And uh, so the deadheading is, is more, you know, refraining from deadheading is more from the plants that you know would have um, it would be a seed resource. Many of the members of the aster family, Asteraceae, have edible seeds for birds. And then there's also the issue of leaving stems for insects to overwinter in. Exactly. Like that's, I don't know if you can see that or not, but yeah, these so are funny. yeah really, oh, tiny, tiny, really small. No, yeah. I don't see how a bird could eat that. So, and I don't want to have a million seedlings in my garden. So I, I yeah. debate, do I just deadhead it so I don't have to weed so much? Yeah, you could do that. I mean, the other thing is the garden's for us too. <laughs> so, you know, especially if you're just taking the flowers off the top and leaving the stems in case somebody wants to live in there. Mm -hmm. I think that's fine. I don't know if I, any, John, you think we missed anything or we answered the questions? It looks like so we're, I just, yeah. Do, I'll put my email address again, um, that if, uh, if I have resource slides that you'd like to get, send me an email. And I can either send you a packet of the resource slides or if there's something specific you want, you can let me know. Let's well, thank see. you very much, Amy, for offering this presentation. Well, thank you for organizing it, John, and well, thank you, to, everyone. Thanks to Focus here. Springfield this TV for uh, facilitating the event as well. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy gardening. <laughs>